Thank you. Uh, so my, my talk will be a little bit different in character. Um, and it's called Great Lakes, Climate Futures, Storylines and Scenarios. Um, this is part of a series of things that I'm doing um, in my retirement where I'm, I'm looking toward a number of projects. And if you're interested in this, there are links here to some of the materials that have already appeared um, in my climate blue column, which I write for the University of Michigan and in a couple of YouTube videos. Um, it would be really helpful if I could see the slides uh, because I don't know what we're talking about all the time. So I am going to. Okay, so for scientists, there's a natural story about our climate future and the story follows from, we have these models, um, we have a lot of models, we have a lot of projections. And one of the things that we are tempted to do is to use those projections to talk about uh, predictions of the future. And there is a great desire that we would have confidence in those and that we could use them for designing, engineering, adaptation, and to manage our future. But when we sit down to do this, one of the things that we find is that the models are very hard to use. Don just went through uh, a presentation of, of some of the work done to tailor some of those materials to make them easier to use. But even once you get to that point, there are some major challenges in extracting knowledge and extracting information from that. So we need alternative ways uh, to, to think about our climate futures and, and to provide knowledge that's suitable for adaptation. And one of the ways that, and one of the things that we need to do is be able to stand up um, and defend uh, the material and to be ethical in our representation of, of certainty and uncertainty. So one of the techniques that has emerged and that we are developing at uh, GLEES at the Great Lakes Integrated and um, Great Lakes Integrated Sciences and Assessment Project at the University of Michigan is something called scenario planning. And scenario planning is a way to, to explore what we would call plausible um, and coherent futures. And one of the reasons to do this is to manage complexity, to manage uncertainty, and to increase usability. And so one of the things, one of the ways we approach this is to develop storylines that serve as a portfolio or a set of scenarios for a specific management purpose, and I'll mostly be talking about flooding um, implicitly today, and uh, they need to be, again, plausible, and by plausible, one of the characteristics we mean is that they are physically reasonable. Um, they need to be divergent, meaning that, you know, if you imagine having an ensemble, that they expand um, Meaningful, meaningful ranges of stressors on management challenges. So one of the things I've been doing in my climate blue column is developing a set of rules and tools, um, which the current draft is linked to there, uh, on how to develop these stories. And I've done this after a lot of experience. We've worked with probably a hundred practitioners at this point, and. And, you know, if we've worked with 195% of them want this scenario approach as opposed to jumping immediately into climate data. And the, the three rules that I'm going to start with, and I'll emphasize here what I call the rule of complexity, which is there's no one thing that climate change will do. And this rule rose out of being asked hundreds of times, well, what will climate change mean to me? What will climate change do? And when the answer says, well, the, you'll probably have more floods and more drought, they sort of walk away. You know, they say, well, you're telling me climate change can do anything. 
And so I think it's important to convey that there is in fact no one thing climate change will do. The next thing is that we have the perception often around that climate change is we have moved or are moving to something we call the new normal, but we're not. We're in a highly transient phase that's going to last for decades. And so I call that the rule of change, that if you're planning for a 30 year time period, you have to be thinking about the non-stationarity because the next 30 year time period is going to be different. We are currently in a state that every 10 years is statistically different from the previous 10 years in terms of the mean and the spread in most locations. And then somewhat contradictory to that is what I would call the rule of continuity, that if it used to happen, then it's likely to continue to happen. And I developed this rule sort of in the discussion about hurricanes where people would say, well, hurricanes are getting more intense. Well, hurricanes, when there's climate change, you know, hurricanes, some are big and, big and wet, some are fast and, fast and intense. They, they come in all varieties and they're gonna to continue to come in all varieties. There's going to be no one way a hurricane or tornadoes will change. So with these rules, it's meaningful to start thinking about stories. So how do we start the stories? There is one driving principle, and, and Don actually also mentioned in the beginning of his talk, and there's one, one principle, one starting point that all the stories follow from, and that is that the planet is warming. The warming is directional. It's about the only thing directional that we have going for us. And the warming will continue for decades. And the warming is not uniform. Um, it's not always um, going to be warmer in all places and all times. But on average, over really, really any meaningful spatial and temporal average, um, it getting cooler is not occurring anymore. So Earth is warming, and that is, that is where we start from this. And then after that, everything is conditional. And so in order to help manage complexity, what I like to do is to pose a set of tools um, that are going to help you think through this complexity. And the first complexity is, is there water available? And by that, I mean, is there a, a source of water at the ground to sort of pump into the atmosphere? Is there water available? And the next conditional question is, is it above or below freezing? And when you, when you start to think about these questions, then you start to see this idea of, of breakpoints that can develop an enormous amount of complexity. So if we think about the Great Lakes, in a broad sense, water is available. And because water is available, um, that means that um, we are almost certain, not almost certainly, we are certainly going to see more extreme precipitation. And it's highly likely that we will see more precipitation if there is a large availability of water. Um, the other thing, as it warms, freezing will become less common and less persistent. So those two things come from those conditions. Now I want to take a moment here with the moisture and the moisture availability because being somewhat provincial creatures, we usually think, oh, well, the Great Lakes are a huge source of moisture. But if you think about the moisture, and I saw a talk in the hydrology session a little while ago by Jamie, um, that much of the moisture that's really supplying this region is coming from the Atlantic or it's coming from the Gulf of Mexico. And that's what I try to convey in this figure. And the, the, the things I want to point out to here is also in the summer, that little red line is that much of the moisture comes to the interior of the continent from the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the Great Lakes are important regionally, 
but we're really sitting inside of this sort of area where we have quite high uh, moisture availability. And as you probably are all aware at this point that the oceans right now are extraordinarily warm. And I wanna say, they're not really extraordinarily warm. They're only extraordinarily warm compared to the past. They're not extraordinarily warm compared to the future. And so there is an amazing amount of moisture availability here. So once we get from there, then we can say there will be more extreme precipitation events because extreme precipitation is in fact relatively strongly related to the increase in temperature and hence tends to be directional. It's more difficult to say whether there will be more precipitation. So here again, when I'm writing these sort of scenarios and these sort of stories, I bring out another tool of whether you are more interested in whether things are accumulating or whether you are more interested in the instantaneous severe event of a storm. And in many aspects, the, many of the problems of the Great Lakes are, are dependent upon accumulation. The accumulation of heat in the lakes, lake levels, saturated ground, um, the consequences of snow cover and how snow cover is changing and leading to runoff um, in the lake. So accumulation becomes very important. But if you're thinking about scenarios and you're trying to actually simplify what might happen, um, this separation between accumulation and instantaneous things is in fact quite useful. So I want to invoke the rule of continuity that in the past we've had both drought and flood and we should expect them to occur in the future. And therefore water excess must be planned for, but the responsible planner also has to consider drought. And, and so that becomes one of the problems is that I would bet right now and you know people would again are often asking me and I, and I say, well, I bet, or if I was planning for the next 20 years, I'm going to plan on water abundance in this region, but you cannot eliminate drought. And this gets to my next conditional point, which is related to accumulation. And the next question is, does precipitation dominate evaporation? or does evapor evaporation as it gets warmer begin to dominate precipitation? And when we think about um, these sorts of changes and we think about the well-known 1997-98 transition and things like uh, lake ice, lake level, um, I, I would actually begin to argue that you know, you're, you're seeing what Drew Grunewald and his colleagues have called the tug of war here between precipitation and evaporation. Um, and so what I am, let's say, betting on right now is that for the most part, we are in a place where we're going to see water abundance. So right now, you would say the precipitation is the more dominant. So if I were to make my bet on the scenarios, and I, I need to actually squirm over here a little to more clearly. I would say the next couple of decades will be more wet than dry. Ice in the lakes will become more rare. Frozen precipitation will move north and west, leading to uh, transient effects of there being periods of very heavy wet snow periods of freezing rain, followed by essentially the disappearance of precipitation that is frozen. So you're seeing that freezing line answering that question of is it above or below freezing, moving from south to north and a little bit west and you're seeing it move in from the Atlantic. Cold air outbreaks I would say are going to be more rare, shorter lived and warmer, it will not be as cold. And there is the distinct possibility that we can move to a state where evaporation begins to dominate precipitation, which could lead to persistent reduction of lake levels. 
So I think my bats are consistent with observations, um, continued warming, um, model guidance and physical principles. I want to end with a couple of figures, well, three figures, um, to add a little nuance um, to, to this as, as well as perhaps add some credibility. And the first figure is very much like uh, one Don just showed, except it's not downscaled. It is observations in climate divisions in the states that border the Great Lakes. It's a difference between 1951 and 1980 from 1991 to 2020. And I wanna make the point that if you're going to be studying trends, Don used a long record from 1901 to 1960, I believe. In Gleason, we use 1950 to 1980. If you go through the standard protocol of updating your climate normal periods, you are in a period of highly non-stationary climate. So you are changing your, your trend when you do that. So I believe that in studies like this, 50 to 80 is sort of the last time uh, before the, the climate signals started to emerge over, over the natural variability and that it's a, it's a reasonably robust period to use. I circle the, the warming in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Northern Michigan, um, to encourage you to hold that in your mind. In this figure, I've taken the temperature observations from just one climate division. It happens to be the one in Southeast Michigan that has Ann Arbor, it has Glural, and it's right across the river from where we are right now. And in the bottom in the gold are the January means um, for 30 year period in 1951 to 1980. And in the top would be uh, the same, the January means in 1990 through 2020. And there are three points that I generally tried to make here. The first is it's clearly warmed. And you see that in every division. Uh, the next is, and it's not as clear in this division as in some of the more northern divisions, is that the variability has increased. But I think the most important thing is if you look from 51 to 80, it was reliably below freezing. And it is no longer reliably below freezing. And this is even true in Apostle Islands. International Falls, you have to go over to the high temperatures, but it's getting above freezing every year now in these regions that were reliably below freezing. And then next, this is the precipitation for the climate divisions. Again, a circle will appear up here on the, um, in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. If you look at the increases in precipitation, those precipitation increases, especially in the upper peninsula of Michigan, um, Wisconsin, are incredibly small. The size of the precipitation increase that we see across the basin or across these states is not geographically consistent. And that was also the region where it's getting warmer. So if I were a planner thinking scenarios, I am seeing a, a yellow flag up here of drought becoming something more concerning or at least summer fire. So um, when I do a set of scenarios uh, for flooding right now, if I were to do four, we generally do four in our planning exercise. One would be high lake levels. One would be extreme precipitation. One would be essentially saturated ground runoff and, and where even a moderate rain causes flooding, um, which is I think strongly related to what I call the warming winter syndrome. And then another one would be compound flooding. If I needed drought ones, there would be the obvious low lake level one, but it would be our winter storm tracks shifting or perhaps a non sequitur to some of you, how is the Bermuda high changing in the summer? 
to tell you whether or not drought is a place of concern. So in the summary points, the challenges of ad adaptation place challenges on modeling capacity that are outside of the fit for purpose for many of our models. We spend an enormous amount of time trying to make these CMIP models suitable for adaptation. And in many cases, we don't, do not achieve that after an enormous amount of work. Scenario planning is a technique that supports, um, I would say, knowledge translation from these models. And if you think about it, um, as much as I've thought about it, scenario planning also offers a way to think more strategically about the portfolio of models that are actually needed in order to more credibly address adaptation. And with that, thank you for staying to the end and living with the technical problems at the beginning. Thank you, Ricky, and thank you for being patient with the technical problems. Um, well, it's a break right now uh, for all the sessions, so there is plenty of time for questions. We can talk all night. <laughs> We got one here. And I think Don has got one. Uh, this question maybe for two uh, professors. <laughs> and yes, the, the climate is warming, the grid is warming. However, this, this warming uh, have the super in imposed by the multi decade Atlantic multi decade oscillation warming at the same time right now. Is that warming the Atlantic AMO have the warming warming curve up similar to the similar to the, 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 the global warming, but the amplitude is bigger. And this point, and when you do the downscaling, and when you use the if you use a single model, that'd be fine. But if you use the multi ensemble member to do the average, and because the phase will be cancel each other of the of the model sample, uh, ensemble, uh, and then this this multi decadal oscillation will be disappear in your in your dance uh, in your dance scale. So I think that how to deal with the problem. Right now, we maybe overemphasize the warming. We have to re reduce, we have to subtract the, we subtract the multi decade oscillation signal from our projection. I mean, my response to that is the Atlantic multi um, decadal oscillation signal is tremendously smaller and more regional than the global signal we're seeing in, in, in models right now. And um, actually what you just said is that the models themselves have no skill in the representation of the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation because you're saying that it is um, being averaged out um, in the ensemble methods. Um, therefore, I would suggest a different approach is needed to um, evaluate um, through expert guidance the role of the, the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation in that case. Don seemed very anxious to respond as well. Yeah, so I mean, one of the reasons we're looking at 30-year averages and statistics of 30 years or 20 years you know, some long t longer time period. So you're capturing climate timescales to avoid some of those aspects of looking at local um, near time effects of different cycles um, that, yes, will be very important locally for a certain amount of time, but that's not capturing the climate signal. And what we're trying to do, much as Ricky talked about his bets, you know, I tend to talk about risk and looking at risk analysis and saying, if you're gonna to try to look at the potential impacts of climate change, 
you want to understand, you know, what is the likelihood of a hundred year or 500 year flood? Um, and um, not for a Pacific year, but over the climate time period. Uh, and that's what we're aiming to try to answer. We actually had one more question for Don online, so I'm going to ask you to keep that mic. I thought it was Ricky and me. Uh, so it's a question from Tom Henry. He asked right as we were. Oh, my girlfriend, Tom. Yeah. Okay, I thought I should tell you who it was. Um, <laughs> how much warmer and wetter do you expect the Great Lakes to be by 2100 compared to modeling from a few years ago? And what surprises you about this? I think what surprises me uh, is that we're not only the wetness, but the fact that the summers are going to likely be a lot drier. Um, so we expect, um, you know, there's a lot of concern in the Chicago area about what's going to happen with Lake Michigan uh, levels, lake levels. And, um, and, and that's true of Lake Erie and the other lakes, I'm sure, as well. Um, but we, uh, the analysis, we don't have the, really the quite the right analysis yet because we need to model the lakes, do downscaling of both the lakes and the land at the same time. But the analysis do suggest that with more precipitation coming as larger events, that when you do get those right kind of storm systems and you do overwhelm the amount of evaporation, that you're going to get larger lake levels and more flooding. And, um, and all indications are that, that, you know, if I were to bet on it, that uh, by the mid-century or beyond, that we will see a lot more concern about higher lake levels. I don't know if that answers Tom's question exactly or not, but. <laughs> Thank you. 